Um, my name is Marty Smith. Um, I come from Morristown meeting this morning. Uh, currently, our meeting is having their business meeting at Mount Laurel meeting, which is a worship group really under our care. Um, I bring greetings from that group to you today. Um, I was asked to speak about my experience in Kenya. Uh, so this is 47 years ago. Um, during that time, we served in the Peace Corps in Kenya, uh, my husband and I. Uh, and the reason we went to Kenya at that time was because, first of all, the time was right. My husband had just finished his PhD. Uh, he was going to be looking for work, looking for a job, and he decided that he could do this as his alternative service. At that point, it seemed the right and the perfect time. We'd not yet started a family, and we had lots of space and time in our life. So it's interesting today that the topic is tra friends traveling in ministry. Well, you know, it's interesting. I didn't. I thought of it as a ministry myself, even though we were officially employed by the United States by the Peace Corps. And I would say it was a teaching ministry that we were both involved in. We prepared for that ministry by going to the Bellevue Hotel in Philadelphia along with about 350 other new recruits, new volunteers. And, but we went over, Bill and I went over to Kenya uh, with a group of about 10 adults and three or four children. These were folks who were our age, which would be late 20s, early 30s, already professionals in the field of teaching primarily, and we went over to fill a slot at Kenyatta University College, and our job was going to be to treat uh, to train teachers, basically. Their job, not the females. The male's job was to, to, to teach in that uh, Kenyatta University. So my husband went over to teach biology at that point. We were, we were trained in language, and some cultural training at the Bellevue, sort of minor language, and a little bit of Kiswahili, uh, enough to get us around. And uh, we got our live va vaccines at that point. We got our live shots. All the other recruits did except for me, because it, they discovered in my Peace Corps physical that I was pregnant. Therefore, I could not take live vaccines. So, for three days, Bill and I waited in Philadelphia until we got a ruling from the Surgeon General of the U.S. that it was okay for us to go overseas to go into the Peace Corps without the live vaccines. So, that was a little bit nerve-wracking. Um, once we got there, um, most of the crew was trained up in, uh, at the Grosvenor Hotel outside of uh, uh, Nairobi. Um, except for the non-matrix spouses, of which I was one. That means they didn't have a designation for us specifically. So we did not get any language or cross-cultural training there. Nonetheless, we made our way in the world to do the best we could. We, there were about six of us spouses, females, basically. But I found a job, which was really lovely, in a local school. Um, just north of Nairobi, Nairobi called Mufega, and I, where I was teaching standard four, so like fourth grade. Um, while there, I taught all subjects in the most Spartan conditions you can imagine. Cement floors, no books, blackboards, tin roofs, so during the rainy season, it was hard to teach. Um, nonetheless, we went ahead, they were all fee-paying students fee-paying students in Kenya. During that time, um, we lived on a compound at Kenyatta University College uh, uh, in a semi-detached bungalow while we were there. Um, and we were along, living there along with a bunch of expatriates. Uh, very few Kenyans, 
local people were living there, but we were with people from all over the world who had come in, mostly USAID people, USAID people. So we didn't have much of a chance to interact with the local folks. Uh, during that time, we attended an unprogrammed un meeting in Nairobi. Uh, it was the only one then, and it had about 10 people in it. Currently, it has about 14 in that meeting, but it's the only unprogrammed meeting in Kenya. Shortly thereafter, I began teaching at the uh, Kenyatta University College. I began teaching audio-visual aids. This is the 70s, mind you. This is the 70s. I began teaching that, which meant that I had to teach well, they were third year students, which means they'd gone through all the theory and education, and they needed to go out in the field and teach. So my job was to show them what they could use in the classroom, so I taught them how to thread 35 millimeter film projectors. I taught them how to uh, use overhead projectors, that was still in vogue, and uh, how to mix native colors, actually, in order for them to have paint to do posters or signs in their classroom. Um, that was an interesting time in my life because just about then I was mm, seven to eight months pregnant and beginning to show a little bit out front. So, but I was having an assembly in this great auditorium there on campus. There were about 300 students assembled to hear me explain about how to use the overhead projector you know, when you're teaching students, and I worked on some teaching techniques during that time. And as I was teaching, I kind of moved around a lot, which I do when I teach, and in, in moving around, my stomach pushed the overhead projector off of the stage and <laughs> onto the floor in front of me. Um, so, uh, that was the moment that students began to rush to the front and actually picked up a watch that I was that I borrowed from one of the students to time myself that was on the floor below. But anyway, they helped me um, pick it all up, put it back on the stage, and my parting comment to them was, in teaching, you have to be ready for it. And <laughs> I was trying. That was kind of scary. But, um, um, Shortly thereafter, my daughter was born, and when you have, in Nairobi, and when you have a child in Kenya, it's a really, really big thing. So I became known as Mama Susan. Mama Susan. And whenever I would go shopping at the market, I would actually wear one of those towels that you drape around yourself, that many people wear today, actually, where the baby would be held like that. And in one instance, when I was shopping, slightly up country in Ruhiru, which is north of where we, we live, um, walking around the marketplace. And actually on that day, I had my daughter in my arm and she was kind of hanging over like, she liked to face outwards. So I was walking around and I heard Mbaya, Mbaya Sana. I said, oh my goodness, what a bad mama. Because you see, I wasn't holding that baby close to myself. So I was Mbaya Sana, Mbaya Mama. <laughs> that that is though where I practice my Swahili. The little bit I got, I it's, I call it my kitchen Swahili. Shortly after she was born, I was able to get uh, because it was expected an in-house aya to take care of my daughter and also to do all the housework and a lot of the cooking. That was my aya for that time. Then, shortly thereafter, I began to teach what was then called micro-teaching techniques. I could teach that there because I had actually spent time in a primary school in Kenya, and before coming to the Peace Corps, I had been teaching in the U.S. for about seven years. So I was able to go in and do a little bit about teaching techniques. So I started a program there called Michael Teaching, and the beautiful thing was it involved films, showing films of different questioning techniques, for example. I got, I was able to get the cooperation of uh, 12 tutors, they called them, they're really the professors on site at Kenyatta. They helped me, voluntarily gave their time to work one-on-one -on -one with students during this program, which was really neat. And that program stayed in place for 10 years after, we, after I left the Peace Corps, so that's kind of nice. 
During that time, we actually got to travel around a lot. We called it up country in our semi-reliable cars that we had. We had more than one. But uh, during that time, we walked, we traveled to Kaimosi, that's up country, in the western province of Kenya, and um, went to their yearly meeting the year we were there, which was, up, we stood up the whole time. We all stood during all the presentations and talk, and a lot of it was in Kiswahili. So, and our daughter was there roaming around between the, she was a little bit of a toddler by then, roaming around. But the beautiful thing about having a child in a foreign country is we never had to worry about making friends because as a mama, as a mama, a lot of respect for that, people came up and wanted to talk to us and, and speak to us. So we had a lot of conversations. Also, during this time, we had a car. In the VW Saloon, it was called. I'm sure that was the name of it. Anyway, we tried to travel from Nairobi up to Kakamega to visit other Peace Corps friends, and our car broke down along the road. Uh, in the middle of nowhere, it broke down. Uh, really lovely, friendly folks came up, came beside us and said, well, look, we'll take care of you. This was a family of Indians of the Sikh denomination who, who picked us up and took us back to their house, which is not far away, fed us, gave us a place to stay for the night, and then actually took the car and sold it. And then we had to take a taxi from their house up to our friends up in Kakamega. Our daughter slept in a drawer that night, a desk drawer, I mean a dresser drawer that night, <laughs> but she was perfectly happy. Well fed, well taken care of. Um, interestingly enough, on that trip, as we finally got to Kakamega to visit our friends, our Peace Corps friends, um, the taxi dropped us off at a local pub, a local tavern, <coughs> because he didn't quite know where our friends lived. So. My daughter was quite hungry at that point and sort of screaming, but never mind, it was raining outside, so we went inside and I, was, I did, I nursed her there. But the amazing thing with all the men, all the men sitting around, nobody said a word. It was quite accepted because that's very common practice in Kenya. So uh, another time, um, this was in Lake Navasha, which is in the Rift Valley, uh, we went on a natural history weekend there, and during that weekend, uh, I got to water ski, which I loved to do at that point on Lake Naivasha. And in Lake Naivasha, uh, there are both hippos and crocodiles within the lake, within the lake, but as a, the person told us as we were going out to begin our little um, boat trip, he said, well, you know, the crocs don't really bother you because they, they're well fed by the fish in, in the lake. So as I was skiing around, my daughter was in the back of the boat with my husband. Um, I went down, and they only had a s single ski to help me, for me to get up again on, and I had a belt around my waist, so I was okay. So I, I, I righted myself, got up again, and continued to ski around the lake, and I'm alive today to tell about it. <laughs> so that was an adventure. That was an adventure. And another time, uh, Bill and I uh, went camping. We camped quite a bit, actually, within the country. We went up country uh, to Savo, 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 which is up country a little farther, well known for its elephants. Um, we were in a little tiny pup tent. There's no rangers around. We carried in our water and everything we needed. Um, in the pup tent, there was our daughter between us. Um, in the middle of the night, uh, I heard a very, very low rumbling sound off in the distance. It could have been five miles away, but it felt like it was outside our tent. So I hoped and prayed that our daughter would not say a word, which she was so good, she didn't. So we managed to, to finish the night safely, then woke up in the morning to go outside to do some things we needed to do, including getting some water. 
And then right outside our tent, maybe 15 feet away, was an elephant browsing on the acacia tree. Right outside, over there. So again, I didn't know if I was up or down wind, but I very, very slowly and carefully put myself back in the tent <laughs> with my family. So we honestly, the trip there was one great adventure for almost two years. Um, we were in that country, and the beautiful thing was we met so many wonderful people within Kenya, and um, we both felt like we'd done some good, my husband and I, in our time there, mostly because of the teaching. Um, we did uh, visit a lot, of, several semi-program meetings in Kenya, up country, and, and that is mostly what they are in Kenya, what they were then and what they are today. There was only one yearly meeting at that time in Kenya. There was only one. So we, so we are, in summary, I found this country to be very, very rich, very rich and very diverse in cultures, mostly among the tribes, most, and there are countless tribes in Kenya, all of whom have slightly different facial features, and, but the dress for most of them is Western dress because of the colonization that occurred previously, mostly with the exception of the Maasai which have somehow managed to maintain their cultural diversity, richness, individuality, even up to this day, against major obstacles, but they still are keeping their traditions. So I left with that sense of a very rich culture, people that I grew to love as we came to know them um, throughout our time there. And we left the country, uh, in 74, flew out of uh, Nairobi, went to Ethiopia, and when we got to Ethiopia, we literally had to ask, we had to shoo the cattle off the runway, because it, it was doubling as a grazing field for farmers. So we were met, managed to go down in our DC-3 and land. I don't know if any of you know what a DC-3 is, no. but a very mobile and very agile uh, plane in those times. So we were able to land there, and then we had to get off the plane. We boarded again, got on. We had 11 pieces of luggage, our daughter in one hand, and also a, a five by eight foot painting that a, a person had done. So that's how we got out of Ethiopia and then flew across Europe and came back home. So it's really a remarkable experience. Um, in the day, things have changed greatly since our time there, uh, which you're going to hear about when Melinda talks about it. But I uh, just want to tell you, it's really surprising. Semi-arid land, primarily, Kenya is, except for the higher elevations and except for down by the Indian Ocean in Mombasa. That was, a, that was a shock to me, that it was that, but that's the way it is. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. I am Melinda Wenner bradley I'm a member of Westchester Meeting. I send greetings from there. Um, my husband and Two of my children have been there this morning. We tried an experiment this morning in flipping around when meeting for business is um, and having it before worship in the hope that it would make it easier for people who are parents to attend rather than having the morning go longer. So to be seen, I'm a little bit anxious just to find out how the morning went. I hope it went well. Um, I also serve you as the yearly meetings um, children's, I'm sorry, youth religious life coordinator. So um, I will just say very quickly, because somebody was asking me before, I think it's worth reminding myself and all of us um, what all that holds so you know what some of the resources available to you are. So my position is both to support the staff and collaborate with and supervise the staff who run the wonderful youth programs that happen on the weekends, um, um, that are retreat programs for the older youth, middle school and high school, um, and the programs for children and families. 
and also then to support religious education programs and what's happening in your local meetings um, across the yearly meeting um, in terms of what are resources, what are some ways that we can support people who carry that ministry of working with our young people. Um, and I want to say there are a couple things. Um, I put some things out on the table where the lunch will be, where donuts were earlier. One is this is a calendar of youth programs for children and families, middle school and high school. If you have young people in your meeting, please take one and put it in someone's hands or take it back and tack it up on a bulletin board. This only goes through December. There are, we are planned out through the rest of the year, but this, this calendar goes through December. Um, and I think it's really important to make an effort for those programs to be on both sides of the river. Um, and so last year, we had three different programs that happened in New Jersey to make sure things are accessible. The programs do move around the early meeting. Um, I grew up in Upper Susquehanna Quarter, <laughs> way up north. I don't, we haven't quite gotten there yet with a program, but I have I've hope, <laughs> maybe someday. Um, and we actually are being hosted. The Young Friends Christmas Gathering will be at Woodstown meeting. Um, so we're really pleased that Woodstown was able to, to host that one. Um, I also put out there a few copies of this really pretty thing that you might have gotten in the mail that talks about, I think I put it upside down, that talks about the community engagement programs that exist in the yearly meeting that really reach across our whole community um, in terms of ages and interests. So this includes myself and care for young people from littles up through high school. Um, Meg Rose is the Young Adult Friends Coordinator, so programs, they have retreats three times a year for young adults. Um, and then, sort of on the other end of things, George um, Schaefer, who people may know, um, Care and Aging Resources, and Olivia Brangan, who really kind of holds across a lot of um, ages and, and uh, interests. Um, community engagement, which includes the collaboratives that some of you may be involved in, some of the wider work that we gather across the early meeting to do. So if you've ever wondered about support, that really goes across our whole community, community engagement. There's an explanation for all of these positions on that pretty piece of paper. And um, we meet together. We, we try to make an intentional um, community among ourselves and hope that in meetings there's the same kind of intention to reach across our different committees across different age groups um, and trying to be the, the one spiritual community we can be together. So that's not why you asked me to come here today, so I'll talk about what I'm actually supposed to talk about. Um, but I'm always glad to answer questions about youth programs and about the work that's happening um, because it is of us and for us as a whole community. So I'm going to have to reach out and forward this. So um, Marty actually brought a paper copy of this. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about takes me is, are the travels that have taken me in the last few years to other parts of the world, to be with friends in other parts of the world. And this is the 2017 version of the Friends World Committee for Consultation map that shows the concentration, we can even pass it around maybe, of where friends are in the world. Um, and so FWCC does this every few years. And um, it's always interesting, particularly to look at this with young people or people who are new to Friends, um, to talk about where there are these concentrations of Quakers in other parts of the world, um, you know, as well as where we are in the United States. And I, I want to start by saying that there were some thank yous that for me are an important part of this presentation. Um, that begin with Millville Meeting, which is the meeting I grew up in in Upper Susquehanna Quarter. So the story actually begins way before the first, before my journeys to Peru. Um, in 1987, I participated in the FWCC Quaker Youth Pilgrimage. Um, I was a student at Westtown at the time, and um, my roommate, who was from Illinois yearly meeting, and I thought this would be a really cool way to go to Europe for part of the summer. I will say that we did not have the most honorable intentions at first, but in taking that trip and those travels and being among other young people, both from across the United States and across the Europe at the time, um, I, it was a transformative experience for me. Um, it was completely transformative. And it was more things than I had really imagined it might be and how it shaped who I became and what my work in the world became and my understanding of what it meant 
for me to be a friend. Um, so my first experience of travel as a friend was traveling as a young person from my home meeting of Millville and having a travel minute. I didn't know that you carried a minute of travel. And so it was really important, that was a really big learning for me as a teenager, that you carry a minute of travel. I still have that minute, first minute of travel from the clerk of my meeting there that I shook with me at 16 um, across to Europe for the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage. Um, I also thank Westchester Meeting, who helped support my travel to Africa this past year, and Obadiah Brown's Benevolent Fund that helped fund the work that we did in having the conference in Kenya that we did that you'll see more about. And my family, um, my husband, I have three children, and my husband who actually, this is my other connection to Salem Quarter, my husband is the head of school at Friends School Mullica Hill, and um, he is at this point, you know, <laughs> And a tremendous support. It's not, you can't leave home and leave three kids at home unless your partner and spouse is behind you. So um, Matt always needs to get a shout out in any, in any place. Um, so this is a photo that actually goes back to 1987, um, but you're going to see, you're going to kind of hear about it again. Um, there was a night on that trip where there were 14 of us who were from across the United States. It was my first time meeting other Quaker kids in the U.S. who went to program meetings. <coughs> and um, my roommate from Illinois had, had first introduced me to that idea. I was like, you go to church? There's a minister? <laughs> um, so we were from a lot of different backgrounds in the United States, and then 14 youth from Europe, across different countries in Europe. And one night we had a really tremendously difficult conversation. We had a meeting for business. Um, that the topic was whether or not we would allow drinking on the trip. And the European youth were quite used to the idea that, you know, having a, a pint or something was okay. Most of them were of the age they could. But for many of the students from the United States, this was very divisive. Um, some people even came from families where there were drinking issues. It was very hard. Um, I remember uh, we were not in unity about how to, what to do. Um, it felt like a very big, important topic for all of us to have some sense of what we we're going to do as a community. There were tears. Um, and at the end of the conversation, a group of us left the room and went for a walk just to get away from it. And we walked, and eventually we ended up running across a field and coming to this dilapidated gate. And I remember we kind of opened it carefully. We probably could have stepped around it, but there was something about opening that gate and stepping through. And we stepped through onto this hillside that looked out across this part of northern England where we were. We were in 1652 country. And the five or six of us sat down on that hillside. We hadn't said a word to each other since we started running. And we sat down and we settled into worship. And there was something about that worship in that moment on that hillside as dusk was falling that it was probably one of my first real memories of feeling that God came very close to me and that out of the conflict that had happened, there was a sense of peace um, and it was a transformative moment for me. Um, I've written more about it, but I won't say more now, but I went back the next morning and took a picture and I care, that picture's been on my desk of every classroom I've taught in <laughs> um, because it, it was a moment where I felt se a sense of where I was, what I was called to do in the world which was to teach. Um, so it has gone everywhere. It's a looking a little worn. It's gone everywhere with me. So in 2016, um, FWCC gathered um, for one of their world plenaries. It was in Pisac, um, Peru, which is up in the mountains, um, up very high. We were warned about altitude sickness, and it was a real thing. Um, and the theme of the gathering was living the transformation. So transformation continues as a theme of my travels and of where I was at that time. Um, when FWCC friends gather, um, there is worship every morning, and each of the sections has care of worship. Um, Africa, because it's such a large section, actually gets two mornings. Friends from East Africa and South Southern Africa each take a morning. Um, and then friends from Latin America and North America each take a morning. So I was asked to bring the message um, from North America that year. And I was asked to do this, I said, I said do you mean like write a sermon? <laughs> um, which of course is a, we would call it a prepared message. Um, and so I did, and that was big work um, preparing for that. 
And then the, the first morning, the Friends from Latin America, as our hosts, um, went first in leading worship. And it, it was a tremendous experience across all those days to experience worship done in the ways that Friends worship across different parts of the world, programmed, semi-programmed. Um, the Friends from, a friend from Britain um, did part of the worship for the Europeans and led us in a guided meditation. With other parts of the world, there was singing, there was dancing. Um, it was tremendous, the diversity of ways in which we worshiped. And yet, there was this sense that there was a, something that, that was a thread that gathered us through all those different ways of worshiping. I never once felt like I was a duck out of water, or this wasn't for me, or these weren't real Quakers, or this isn't how we do it. There was such a sense of spirit gathered there with those people that even across those different ways of worshiping, the, pr the practices, the ideas of who we were as friends and that being central, you could feel that in the space. But the first morning, um, the friend from Latin America preached, and he was a very charismatic preacher. He was a younger man from Guatemala, and he paced back and forth on the stage, and it was very charismatic. And I went to somebody afterward and said, I have paper. I was going to read from a podium. I don't, it's not going to look like that. And everyone said, well, that's fine. And of course, I came to know that really was fine. And the hotel we were in actually built a, like a pulpit, like a podium for me, like overnight. They, they were so incredibly hospitable. Um, this is a little snapshot from home. My kids were younger, and I made them this so they would know how many days I was going to be gone and so that my little list would know when I would be back. <laughs> um, so I gave them an FWCC map, and I sent a picture every day for them to paste in and fill in um, my travels. I'm a teacher by training. <laughs> So this is a little bit dark, but that's the, um, you can see the um, logo for the time together for the, for the living the transformation. Um, those are, I'm sorry it's so dark, those are friends um, who are from southern Africa, which include people of European descent, people of African descent who make up um, yearly meetings in southern Africa. That was a morning that they were doing worship for us. I don't know if turning out the lights would be helpful or if it would be. A okay. Um, this is the large auditorium where we worshipped, where we had plenaries, where all the speakers happened. I don't know how interesting that is to see. Um, and this is a beautiful picture of um, the marketplace. You were just so close to the sky, it felt like, that high up in Peru. Um, and just all the colors that existed in the marketplace, it was quite tremendous to be there. Um, <laughs> The picture on the right, corn, is an important part of food and culture there. Um, this was actually, these were um, part of the, the stones in the, in the street um, in, the, in the city of Pisac. And then on the left, it looks, it, it's hard to see because of the light, but these were salt ponds. And so the water would come into the salt ponds and the salt would um, solidify on the top. It was just the coolest thing. We came down this ravine. It was a frightening drive. Um, but there were just, it's like this patchwork and they're all salt ponds. It's salt. If you've ever seen like, you know, pink salt, they were, they were selling, I know that one's like Himalayan, but they were selling all different kinds of salt. So we got to do a few touristy things too. Um, this, the talk that I gave, there, the morning that North America led worship was called um, Seed Pods and Stories, Making a Place for Children in Living the Transformation, and was about the spiritual lives of children and how we support that, how that is an important part of who we are as friends and being an all-ages community. And part of the story that I told there was about the 1987 pilgrimage and how FWCC in that time um, and that trip had helped shape my worldview and my eventual, eventual work in the world. Um, while I was in Peru, I'll go back to a Peru slide, won't jump ahead yet. Um, while I was in Peru, um, I also shared about um, faith and place stories, which are the Quaker stories that we've developed here in the United States um, in the manner of godly play, and also about the Quaker Religious Education Collaborative 
Um, and so a lot of new connections were made with people there um, from across the world. I had wonderful conversations with a young mother um, from New Zealand, and now friends there in New Zealand in her meeting are using faith and play stories. Um, and we have, there's a connection there. So it was like this weaving, um, you know, and threads going on, touching each other. The one time I had an experience of feeling um, that sense of distance from friends from another part of the world was a group of young adults were going, they were sort of all going out somewhere together, it looked like, and they stopped and they said, Melinda, do you want to come with us? We're going out to evangelize. And I was like, no, thank you, I'm okay. But it is important to remember that for friends in Latin America, for friends in parts of Africa and East Africa, um, there is an evangelical um, component to, to being a friend. Um, in their mind, it is, is reaching out and not hide, hiding their light under a bushel. It's about letting people know who friends are and, and that they're there. Um, so while I was there, a particular connection was made with a couple of friends from Britain nearly meeting. And I was then invited um, by the Wor Quaker World Relations Committee of Britain Yearly Meeting to visit with them um, in the spring of 2018, or 2018. And <coughs> that's, my, that's my Lucretia Mott bag. You can get them at Arch Street Meeting House. She goes everywhere I go. Cool. I always feel a little bit better carrying Lucretia around with me. <laughs> and interestingly, the trip actually started at the place where the FWCC pilgrimage in 1987 had left off, one of the last days we were there. Um, the group of teenagers together. In 1987, we'd gone to Jordan's meeting. Jordan's meeting is the meeting house outside London where William Penn um, and his second wife are buried. And there's the grave of William and Hannah Penn. And um, there is a tremendous William Penn exhibit there at Jordan's meeting. I learned some things about William Penn outside London. Nobody had taught me as a kid growing up in Pennsylvania or as a Quaker kid growing up in Pennsylvania. Um, and he's about to have his 375th birthday in October. Um, I've been thinking about how we want to celebrate Penn, but also hold in the balance um, his slaveholding and relationships with the Lenny Lenape and how, how to hold all those different pieces. It's a little more complex, um, but it was interesting to sort of um, start there where I had ended before. This is Friends House in London. It's a little bit like Friends Center. Um, it also reminded me a little bit of, in Harry Potter, the Ministry of Magic. I had this weird sense that I was like in the, it really felt like I was in the Ministry of Magic being in it, um, not just because the accents. And they have their rooms. You, you, these are signs for their various rooms. So there's the George Fox and the Margaret Fell. And those with Fry in the William Penn room, but I was delighted that there was also the Bayard Rustin room and the Lucretia Mott room and the John Woolman room. So some representation of friends from across the pond. This is in their lunch room. I think this is hilarious. It's the thing that holds all the cold drinks and stuff and it has the fox quote, be still and cool in thine own mind above it. So if you don't know where to go for a cool drink, that's where they are. I just thought that was funny. Um, and then from London, I stayed with a wonderful friend named Lee Taylor, um, who I'd met in Peru, and she created a pretty amazing itinerary um, that took me around a, a number of places to speak to meetings, um, specifically about children's ministry and about godly play and about faith and play, the faith and play Quaker stories. Um, so the meeting house, um, the same meeting house is the outside and inside on the two top pictures. And then the bottom is from Sheffield. There's a, a sign outside Sheffield meeting. Quakers have met in the vicinity since 1668. And then the painting on the right is something that the Sheffield young friends, the high school age friends painted. Um, that was one of their themes in their yearly meeting one year was live adventurously. So one day Lee said to me, we were driving to Swarthmore Hall. We were going north. And I told her my story about 1987, and she said, I think I might know that place. And so we parked at um, another meeting house and went for a walk, and things started to look very familiar to me. And then we walked across a field outside Yeland, Yeland which is a village in England, and I realized where I was, and that's the gate. And it's been built up 
but we walked through the gate. And I was back. <laughs> and it was a pretty tremendous moment for me, almost 30 years later, to walk through the gate and be back standing on that hillside where it felt like God had come so close to me and I'd had such a sense of looking forward and here I was in that place again. So I now have a double frame on my desk <laughs> that has the 1987 photo and then the 2018 photo on the other side. And the beauty of Facebook, I really quickly Facebooked the picture to my friends who are still my friends from West Town who were on the pilgrimage with me and then other people got tagged by them and then other people got tagged. And then I suddenly figured out through somebody in, in, who lives in Australia tagging somebody else on Facebook in this pic, with this, the picture that a woman who I had known in New York yearly meeting when we lived there and I had served New York yearly meeting as their youth um, staff person who had helped me. She'd always really helped me a lot with youth things. We realized she had been one of the adults on the pilgrimage with me in 1987. We had not put it together <laughs> from each other's names, but we had been together on that pilgrimage. She was in her tw early 20s, uh, mid 20s, had been one of the adult chaperones with us. And we suddenly realized who each other <laughs> were. So. Um, so we stopped at Swarthmore Hall. Um, it is a pretty magical place. There is just this sense of the spirit there. Um, and um, I was invited to do a program and share the Margaret Fell story, which is one of the Faith and Place stories. Um, it's one dear to my heart because I wrote it and I was the primary author before our group worked on it together. And I told the story at Swarthmore Hall. I got to tell her story there at Swarthmore Hall. And one of the women who was there is a docent who works for Swarthmore Hall. And she said, I'm so excited. Can you email me the script? I'd like to see it. I feel like this is what I've needed when I have like daisy scouts that go through Swarthmore Hall, like school groups. She said, I'm going to make some people out of toilet paper holders. <laughs> And I thought about that overnight, and the next day I went back to her and I said, I think you should keep my Margaret Fell materials, um, which were the first, like the prototype we first made when we were writing this story. So it was so fun for me. There's, that's, those are the materials there with George and Margaret. Um, that's a picture in, I took the picture of the materials in the room that is the meeting room where they, before friends began having worship together at Swarthmore Hall, um, where Judge Fell would sit in his office a little ways off um, and friends would gather in this um, main eating gathering room in Swarthmore Hall. That's a picture there. So, her, it's, so Margaret stayed behind, which felt just right to me um, at that time. These are more pictures from inside Swarthmore Hall. I mean, it's a museum. Lee and I tried to sneak in one night with our tea and the, the doors, we got through. The, like, there's a bed and breakfast side, which has been renovated and is extraordinary and beautiful. Pretty simple, but really nice. And then there's the museum side and we snuck in with our tea, but it felt kind of creepy to like, sit in the, uh, the older part. But that's George Fox's traveling trunk on the upper left. That's George Fox's bed on the bottom left that actually folded all up. It was a traveling bed. It could fold up and go into a case. It was made from very heavy wood, though. Um, that's the, the fell baby's cradle on the upper right where all Margaret's babies slept. And then that's the, one of the, that's the room that I stayed in on the bottom right. Um, it still has all the old windows. They kept um, some of those historic things, the old beams. Um, this is the, the meeting house that's very close to Swarthmore Hall that George Fox gave the money to build later as meeting houses began to be built. It actually says ex dono G. Fox above the door. And then the inside um, meeting houses in Britain um, typically have, they've taken out the benches in many of them and have chairs instead in a circle. Um, they always have a table and flowers in the center of the room, um, which somebody at one point tried to say, oh, people in the US never have a table with flowers. And you do here, and at Westchester we do as well. I was like, no, some of us do. Some of us do. And, and some of us have moved our benches to be able to sit more in the round together. That's just a gratuitous, wow, isn't Britain pretty picture. <laughs> 
I took this one from my 92-year-old father. It's trees and sleeves. He loves trees and has trees and sleeves on our farm, so I thought he'd like to see they were reforesting. Re and this is the biggest rhubarb patch I've ever seen in my life, which I was really excited about. This is at Woodbrook, which is like their Pendle Hill. I mean, not Pendle Hill, Pendle Hill. It's like their conference and retreat learning center, Woodbrook. It had incredible gardens. I was pretty excited by all the rhubarb. So then we went back to Britain Early Meeting. And I was there in part because my travels took me up to their time in session at their annual yearly meeting session. Um, so I got to work with lots of different children. I worked with all their different ages of children's groups while I was there at yearly meeting. Um, there was a friend down there on the bottom who we were working with, the Faith and Play story. Um, th those were the children who, I don't know if people, the, the Faith and Play story gifts has pieces that are in like a puzzle piece. Um, they each were coloring um, a person and writing about what they, what they give to their community, what was the gift that they have that they share. Um, and there was a little girl sitting with me who I found out later, this is actually, I might cry, um, one of the girls on the 1987 pilgrimage with me who was just a bright light, her name was Annie, she had red hair and was just amazing. She had died of cancer a couple years before as an adult woman and one of her children was there and was with me and it was her daughter who was sitting near me and who said to me how do you spell cooperative <laughs> and it was putting cooperative on her p puzzle pieces what she was a, a gift that she gave her community and I found out later that it was Annie's daughter Um, so this is like the big meeting room. This would be like at Arch Street when we're in the big meeting room. This is a new modern part of Friends House in London. Um, it's called The Light, and it seats about 1,000 people. So on the Sunday morning of yearly meeting, I had been asked, um, they decided it was all ages worship for them that morning. They had children and families in the space, um, and I was asked to tell um, a faith and play story. And so I told the story listening for God, um, to probably close to a thousand people in the room. <laughs> and um, I had a table they'd given me, I was mic'd and there was a camera across from me and a screen behind me that they were, and was anyone at sessions this year, a Philadelphia yearly meeting sessions? We did that story this year with lots of circles um, who were helping to tell the story. So I told the story and it was being shown on the screen, the story itself, not me, on the screen behind me. And there was a little girl sitting in front of me who had a headband with rabbit ears. And I invited the children if they wanted to come sit closer to me. And a whole bunch of them had come and sat closer to the story. And um, I leaned forward because I realized it was going to be hard for people behind her to see. And knowing I was might, I said, friend, I'm, I wonder if you might take off your, your headband and your rabbit ears. And she just smiles at me. <laughs> And her older sister sitting next to her swipes the rabbit ears off. And she just quietly takes the rabbit ears, a little bit like Mary Fisher, you know, continuing the journey after she was put off the ship. She just puts the rabbit ears back on and smiles at me. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I am not going to get into a tussle with this child in front of 999 other people. Um, so, but people were kind of, you know, giggling. And so we went on. And it was fine. And other kids moved. But I was told that as the camera was moving across the story, that they were watching on the screen as I was telling it. It was like story, story, rabbit ears, story, story. So I, found out her later, her, I later found out her name was Harriet. We made friends. It was all good. Um, but they were in the process of deciding whether or not to revise their faith and practice. And after, the war, after I told the story, we settled into waiting worship. Um, there were several messages that rose for friends from having heard the story. And I was told later that in the business session that followed, um, the story was again referenced um, as they were thinking about trying to come, you know, do the discernment to come to unity about um, their faith and practice. So the power of stories um, spreading across many places and many people. Um, some of the things that have come out of that particular travel and ministry is that they, that's the bookstore at Friends House. They now carry faith and play. They didn't know about those stories. There were people there doing godly play. They didn't know we had Quaker stories too. I had told them a couple times, but now we have um, that is this being the Quaker stories are being sold in their bookstore. Um, and I did a workshop. There was a no, I'm sorry. This is a workshop that would happen after I'd left. Um, that they that their children and young people's work did 
that was a day-long workshop introducing these things. Um, I may, I've been, we've been in conversation about going back and actually training storytellers to use both, including the Quaker stories. So now we come kind of full circle to where we started with Marty um, sharing her story of travels in Kenya. Um, these are my travel companions, <laughs> my other travel companions along with Lucretia. Um, that is actually a little um, giraffe that a friend of mine who went to the last um, FWCC gathering brought back for me when it was in Kenya. Um, so it needed to come home again. And that is George Fox, Lego George Fox. You may recognize Lego George Fox. Um, when I was teaching sixth grade Quakerism at West Town School, um, one of those beautiful moments where you know you've reached a young person that you might not have learned in another way how you'd reach them. Um, a sixth grade student came over to me and quietly put that on my desk and said, I made this for you, it's George Fox, and walked away. <laughs> um, so, and then the other kids crowded around and were like, oh, that's the hat from such and such and the face from such and such. But he got the shaggy locks and he got the grim, stern look, I think probably, right? So they came along. Um, this was a trip that was years in the making. Um, Beth Kalea, who at the time was the um, religious ed education and outreach coordinator for New England Yearly Meeting. We had been in conversation with a friend named Marion Baker from New England Yearly Meeting for a number of years. And in 2016, that June, two friends, um, two women who were um, leaders in their Sunday school programs there. Um, in Kenya, as Marty said, most meetings are programmed or semi-programmed. I mostly had contact with program meetings that, that often call themselves churches. Um, and call their religious education program Sunday School. Um, so two women, um, Agneta um, and Ma Margaret, um, came in June 2016. They were here for the United Society of Friends Women gathering and had a conversation with us about godly play and faith and play as ways to approach um, Bible and Quaker stories for Quaker children and how this would fit with curriculum that they used um, and curriculum that they might consider using. So we wanted to really clarify before going. I mean, the invitation was almost immediate in 2016, but we wanted to clarify that the East African friends themselves were requesting the workshop, exactly what the content should be that would be offered that met their needs, and perhaps most crucially, how to build genuine community with East African friends. Uh, we were very aware of colonial roots and the possibility of, um, of continuing in a way that would not be about centering the needs of friends there. So we were really clear that it needed to be the beginning of a walk together and not an isolated event. Um, and we labored with the differences in pedagogy that we were aware of in their educational systems and that evangelical approach to scripture. How would the work that I was bringing, the work that I do with these stories, that's really about continuing revelation. I mean, it's the reason why an Episcopal storytelling curriculum um, that some folks in the room have worked with as well as me, it's the reason why it has resonated for Quakers is because it's really about continuing revelation. It's not about one answer or now you know the scripture, you're good, here's what it means. It's about how does it open for us. So we, we struggled with how was that pedagogically and, and theologically going to be received. Um, so we worked with friends there. We had a lot of conversation, and it really did take almost three years um, for us to get there. Um, but in January of this year, um, I flew to um, East Africa. It's a long trip, as Marty can also attest to. You fly to Europe first, and then um, so there are direct flights now, but they're almost 24 hours long, and that really freaked me out. <laughs> I wasn't sure I could be on a 24-hour flight. It kind of scared me. Um, so that is a big picture of Africa um, and the tremendous diversity of um, what's there in terms of um, geography and the landscape, and then a closer picture of where I was um, near Lake Victoria, which you can see below Uganda there and to the left of the, of the pin. Um, closer to Uganda, right? Yeah, closer to yeah. Uganda. Western. Right. Um, and Tanzania, right? Mm -hmm. So Lucretia went again. This time I was very tickled. My daughter for Christmas that year 
um, my daughter who's now gone off and started college at Barnard College, her Christmas present to me was a bag that says, empowered women empower women. <laughs> so that went along with Lucretia, which I thought Lucretia would appreciate. Um, and the first place that I stayed was with a woman um, named Judith, um, who um, has actually founded an organization called Women of Faith Foundation Limited that's about empowering other women who are widows, um, women who are older, women who do not, um, who with, even within a, a society that remains pretty patriarchal, um, need to be empowered to, to have their own work and to be um, independent and supported. So first I traveled from Nairobi to Kisumu and stayed with some friends there, um, Sean and Katrina McConaughey, who are with um, FW um, Ministries in East Africa. And then from there, um, they drove me up to Friends Theological College, which is in Kaimosi. Um, the gathering was at Friends Theological College um, from January 16 to 19. And um, it was billed as being a conference for religious educators. And Marion and others sought to get some of the younger, um, a lot, really an emphasis on getting women there and the empowerment of women. And we ended up with a group that was a little more diverse than that. There were several men as well as women, um, kind of across a lot of ages, actually. But people who we hoped would take the work from the conference and then go and be leaders in their own um, churches, their own yearly meetings, their own neighborhoods with this. Um, so there were 24 participants from 13 yearly meetings in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Tanzania and Uganda are each one yearly meeting today. Kenya began to split in the time after Marty spoke of it being one yearly meeting. Kenya began to split into yearly meetings, um, often for reasons that were more political than theological. Um, and to hear some of the people say to me, Often, uh, I will I'll say the women would say, it was often the men and political things going on within their communities that caused the splitting off to happen. Um, so our gathering, we were told that our gathering, with, which was under the umbrella of the Quaker Religious Education Collaborative, that it was the first time since um, the late 70s that this many different yearly meetings from Kenya sent representatives to a single conference there. Um, so that was, there was a real sense of uni unity around how many people were gathering there. Um, this was our schedule for the time. That's a classroom. FTC is, is where um, pastors in Kenya um, and in East Africa go to be. It is the premier um, education to go and be a pastor or be an evangelist in that part of the world among friends. So that's a classroom there. Um, during the conference, participants were, gi were given instruction and in using godly play and faith and play stories. But we really also expanded that much more. It was sort of a first taste of that. It was really more about exploring the current state of their work as religious educators, affirming their ministry of working with children. We talked a lot about parent support and education, um, and that was where we had differences culturally that we needed to really work through approaches to parenting and what were the possibilities. Um, and collaborative partnerships with one another and between them and other church leaders in their churches. Um, there was a real focus on empowerment of women. I told the story of Sarah and Abraham one day um, in my desert bag. You always have to have a piece of the desert to tell stories from the Old Testament. And I had just brought my bag with me without sand, of course, on the airplane, and I was given this incredible rich brown, it was very different sand um, that I then worked with during the time there. And I love it that there's now sand from Peru and sand from Kenya embedded in this piece of felt <laughs> that I carry around with me places. Um, but I told the story of Sarah and Abraham, and of course there's a piece of that story that's about Sarah standing outside the tent when the visitors come and tell Abraham that they will be the parents of a great family, that they will have a child. And one of the women raised her hand and said, I, I do not understand, and she was very serious. She said, I don't understand why Sarah was not invited to the meeting. And it was just this great moment of, within a completely different context, I mean, they knew that story biblically, but to, to really be thinking in a way about why wasn't Sarah invited to the meeting. 
So we had gifts that we brought, um, books that were donated by the Godly Play Foundation and the Faith and Play group, um, pictures. I was careful when I packed up my stories. I had to pack all the stories I needed to take. Um, I actually took different people. I have little Quaker folk that I use in my, my um, Faith and Play stories that are all painted some shade of gray clothing. And then I do, they are diverse. They're, they're heads, the little wooden figures' heads. Some are brown, some are lighter brown, some are plain wood um, to look like people who are white. But um, I decided not to take those with me and instead took a set I had that were wood and were all different shades of wood. Um, it really felt important for there to be space, as there always needs to be, for people to have both mirrors and windows when they hear a story. Um, windows to see themselves in the story and mirrors, uh, mirrors to see themselves in the story and windows to be able to see other people in the story. So that's the Faith and Play story queries on the right. Um, so that, the picture on the top left are friends working with a story during the training. Um, that's a stage photo. They were very, they, they were having fun getting, having a stage photo. But as soon as I got home, almost within a week, I started getting pictures of people who were doing the work, who had gone home, and who were telling stories in whatever way they could put together materials um, in their home meetings. And one of the things I sometimes hear in sharing about godly play and faith and play here in the United States is, well, the materials are too hard to make or they're too expensive. And I have a response to that for friends in the US. I'm not going to say now. It has to do with making your own and finding ways to do it. We were very aware of that. You know, there's no Michael's Craft Store to go and find what you need in East Africa. And so we were careful. We spent some time talking about this and how to do it. And people have, have shown us that there is a way. I did a materials making um, workshop one afternoon and um, gave some things I brought with me. But immediately, what was more important was the conversation about how I can use banana leaves to do that and how I can go and find wood to do that. Um, it was a real opening to listen to friends there find a way forward. Um, so the books were given to the library there. Um, we presented them to Dr. Robert Wafula, who's the principal of Friends Theological College, to add to their religious education section of their library, where the hope being that they can be borrowed. or um, And I've been emailing with these 24 friends and sending them as many things as attachments as I can. Um, the, picture, the picture on the left is, was, one day we said, well, it was the start of one of the workshop pieces. We said, why don't we list some hopes you have, hopes for the children in your care in your churches. And I ran out of room. <laughs> it was the most tremendous list. Um, you know, and much, much of it would feel like we could have made this list here together today. Um, it was a really a pretty extraordinary thing. I kept going and going and flipping the paper until I got to the end. And then um, I didn't come home with this piece of paper because toward the end of the conference, a young man in his 20s came to me and said, can I have that? And I said, sure, you're going to take it home. I mean, I'm, it's OK. Let me take some pictures first. He said, I want to take it and show it to the young people I work with. I want them to know what the hopes are we have for them. I want to take it home for them. Um, and on the right-hand side, that is um, Judith Nandakove, who I'd stayed with um, in Nairobi. Judith um, and Beth Kalea, who some people might recognize, who's our friend from New England Yearly Meeting. Um, what rose from the group was an epistle. Um, and you can read that epistle on the Quaker, on the Quaker RE Collaborative website. Um, two major outcomes of our time together, in addition to the friendships, the connection, the learning we did both ways. Um, one was that friends there decided to found um, an East Africa branch of the Quaker RE Collaborative. So what started only five years ago here at Pendle Hill, when, a, when four of us from across four different yearly meetings said, hey, let's get together. We probably don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. And we could be sharing things about religious education across our yearly meetings and not be siloed. Only a few years later, here we were in East Africa, and friends there said, we want to have an East Africa branch of this work. And two of those friends, Judith and um, Dan Kinsabwa, came to the QREC gathering this past um, August. 
last month. So that is one piece. Um, Friends from Kenya, QREC hosts um, conversation circles every month online. Friends from Kenya, it's like 11 p.m. there, will be on those conversations when we, and so it's like friends from across the United States and Kenya, and sometimes parts of Latin America, talking about resources for Christmas or resources for supporting parents, whatever that might be. And the other outcome was a sense that there is a need to capture the stories of the Quakers who are the, were the first Quakers in East Africa, the friends there who were Af friends of African descent, Kenyan friends. Some of them have passed away, some of them are older. How to capture the stories of early Quakerism in East Africa, whether that becomes faith in place style stories or whether it's captured in some other way, a sense that their young people don't have the same sense of Quaker identity because they don't have those stories. Um, and so um, we are now working, QREC is working with Friends the Theological College and Dr. Wafula to create a Quaker history archives of the stories, um, gathering, interviewing, gathering, meeting, writing the stories, and creating an archive of those stories so that that, and working also with ESR and Earlham, um, who have a wonderful archive, um, and friends here, things like the Swarthmore and Haverford archives to create that. Um, I'm almost done. So back in Kisumu, um, I went to church one morning with Sean and Katrina McConaughey, um, and that was a picture of the church at the Kisumu Friends Church and Friends School. There are a lot of Friends Schools in East Africa. They look different than our Friends Schools do, but they are Friends Schools. Quakers are recognized as being um, people to trust, people who are part of a larger community, um, people who are respected, I was told, um, in, in Kenya in particular. And the picture on the bottom is two pictures together. It's a first day school classroom. That's their Sunday school classroom at the Kisumu Friends Church. Um, a woman named Sarah, she just said hello to me this morning on Facebook Messenger from Kenya, from Kisumu. Um, a woman named Sarah said to me, all I have is chalk. Um, all she has in a first day cl classroom, her Sunday school classroom, is chalk. Um, and so I've sent her some little Quaker meeting and me books and a children's Bible, but um, it, is, it is sobering and tr in some ways transformational to recognize what people do with an awful lot less than the resources that we have available to us. And that is a picture of um, what's a, a godly play story that I've adapted for friends. It's, it's um, a story about the Good Shepherd and World Communion. I call it the Good Shepherd and World Gathering for friends because our gathering is, is what we, is our communion together. Um, but that's just a picture of the story. And I had told that story and one morning I told people gathered from across the theological college in the space to hear, we had worship with them one morning. So all the students, all the teachers, faculty, um, the principal, and on that morning, I actually told Jesus and the children. And at the end of the story, um, Dr. Wafulu stepped forward and said, and he, he spoke to the young people in the room. He spoke to those pastors in training in the room. He said to them, this is where your work begins. Your work in your churches begins with the children, the children and their parents. That is where your work begins. And that was a tremendous statement for the principal of this theological college to make to those pastors in training. And it was incredibly affirming for the 24 people we were working with who were feeling often isolated. I don't know if you've ever felt this if you worked in a first day school. They felt isolated from other committees, isolated from the ministry happening in the rest of the church. For them to be affirmed that there should be that connection between what was happening in the wider community and their work with young people was incredible for them. Um, so the circle gets wider. There's always room for more. And my travels have really been about both my own transformation personally and about how when we create community with one another, when we open our circles to make our community bigger, um, we are all enriched in that. And, and, and God is very present in that work. I think that's the end. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's the end. 
Um, if you are interested to know more about um, the Quaker RE Collaborative and its work, um, it, it, there's a half piece of paper out on the table out there. Um, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting has scholarships. If you're ever interested in going to the annual gathering of this group, we have scholarships um, for people to attend. If you're interested in knowing more about godly play and faith and play, there's a flyer. Um, there's going to be a training at Pendle Hill next winter. It's an experiment. Instead of having to give a whole weekend to, be, to do it, it's three Saturdays across three months um, at Pendle Hill. So the hope being that for friends in the Philadelphia area, um, it would be accessible that way. You don't have to do it so that you get asked to do something in your meeting with children. You can do it for your own en enrichment um, and your own spiritual growth. Um, and then, I don't know if people saw, but the issue of faith in practice that came out this spring um, had an article about um, the work that I did in Kenya. So if you're in in interested in reading more, there are some of these out on the table as well. And I'm glad, I think it's probably time to go eat lunch. I think we've probably gone over the time for the program, but I'm glad to answer questions <coughs> quickly here, but also answer questions after we've gone to lunch. Well, Bob? Have you considered uh, recreating youth quake and having it occur again at some point? That's a bigger question than I can answer here. <laughs> I think that I've heard a lot about youth quake both the strengths and also what was challenging. Um, and I think QREC would be a place where some of the people who could meet each other to have that conversation might find a container for that. Um, but it has not been, you know, I think there are other things going on that people um, think about in its place, but I'd be glad to. You had mentioned about the uh, joining together in Africa uh, these yearly meetings that had split. You mentioned also about the uh, joining together in Peru of these various uh, uh, branches that we have. Mm -hmm. We have three different branches here in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, our son Matt attended the last youth point to have occurred here. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, that uh, his experience with that, as well as uh, from what I from what I anticipate from your uh, presentation, is that uh, that's one of the major things that we really need mm -hmm. to have. So FWCC has has thought about how to do a Quaker Youth Pilgrimage again, and the issue of climate and carbon footprint is a, big pro is a big part of not trying to bring people together across con continents very often. Um, so, but I'd be glad to think about that more. I know friends are anxious to go to lunch and move on. I'm glad to answer other questions during lunch. Thank you.